Melody and I uh, were on vacation the last couple of weeks. Uh, I'm completely worn out. I was hiking and biking and kayaking and everything. It was great and refreshing, and it was so awesome to be back this morning with all of you. We missed you. It's so cool to be able to worship Jesus together. Um, I, I love that I have a family that I can do that with. So thank you so much, whether you're here every Sunday or whether this is your first time here. My name is Dave, and I'm one of the pastors here. And I want to ask you, if you could with me today, just to use your imagination for just a couple of minutes. Okay, could you do that with me? Um, kids are usually a lot better at this than adults are. So adults, let's see what we can do here. Use your imagination. Pretend, think of someone in your life or maybe a group of somebodies who have really hurt you deeply at some point in the past. Now, I know that might be a little difficult at times, but let's, let's try to use our imagination, think about this. Maybe it's somebody right now that has hurt you and that you're thinking about. I want you to think of that person in your mind or that group of people in your mind right now. And then I want you to use your imagination and imagine that God spoke to you and you have no reason to doubt that he spoke to you, like you know he did. And he said, I want you to go to that person or those group of people and I want you to tell them how much I love them. And how if they just change their ways and repent and turn back to me, I want to enter into a relationship with them. Those people who really hurt you deeply, okay? Now, I won't ask you to raise your hand or anything, but like, if we were honest, what would our reaction be if something like that happened? How many of you would actually go and do it? Because you're like, nope, God told me to do it. I'm going to go do it. Even if I don't really like that person, even if they've hurt me deeply. And if we're really honest, how many of us <laughs> would pray that they burn in H-E double hockey sticks forever? <laughs> All right? So I want you to keep that in your mind as we um, finish up our series called A Sunday School Summer Today with one of the most famous passages and one of my favorite passages in the whole Bible, the story of Jonah and the... Nope, not the whale. I... <laughs> I heard, not the big fish. No, no. Actually, we think about the big fish. We think about the whale, but the story isn't really about any of that. We get stuck there. But the story is about Jonah and the Assyrians. Jonah and the Assyrians. And that's what we're going to talk about today. But before we do, I want to invite God's Spirit to lead us and guide us as we look into his word today. And I think if, if you would give me a minute... Uh, it'd be appropriate for us to pray for the people in Maui, Hawaii today, right? Uh, unbelievable. If you've ever been there, you can imagine the devastation and the pain. And I just want those folks to know they're not alone. I think it's important for us to lift them in prayer. So would you pray with me right now? Thank you for being here and joining us. God, I'm, I'm grateful to be able to be back um, in my home and worshiping Jesus, worshiping your son our resurrected Savior with my brothers and sisters. And I'm grateful for being able to sing, being able to listen to the beautiful music, and being able to open up your word and hear from your spirit speak to me, speak to us today. God, um, pray that you give us ears to hear what you want us to, to hear. God, I thank you for every person that you've brought here today, whether um, it's their first time or they've been coming for a long time. I know that you have a special meaning and reason that they're here, and, and I know you want them to know how much you love them. And God, I pray that that same thing would be known for all of our uh, friends, people in Maui, Hawaii, those who have suffered such an incredible loss, people who are still, uh, not only have lost their homes, but have lost loved ones. God, I just pray that you would reassure them that there are people praying for them in Medina, Ohio, that there are people who love them, that they are not alone. And God, I pray that uh, you would use your church to raise them up and that somehow through this terrible disaster, God, that you would be glorified in it and through it. Uh, we don't know why things like this happen, uh, but God, we know that uh, there's, a, there's a deeper purpose and meaning, and I pray that we'd be able to find that through you and in you. So guide our time today. We pray this all in Jesus' name. Amen. Hey, if you have a Bible and you want to follow along, go to the Old Testament book of Jonah. That's where we're going to be today, the Old Testament book of Jonah. Let me give you a little background information if you're newer to church for this story. Okay, I mentioned that it's, the story is about Jonah and the Assyrians. Well, who are the Assyrians? The Assyrians are a group of people, probably the meanest, nastiest group of people you can ever imagine. 
And I know we don't like talking about this because we live in such a sanitized culture, but this group of people uh, were known for a special way that they attacked their enemies. Their enemies were the Israelites. The Israelites were God's chosen people. And the Assyrians would use something called a siege to attack people. Now, does anybody know what a siege is? Somebody help me out. What, what's a siege? Okay, that's great. Essentially what you do is you, you surround a city and you don't let any food or any water or any supplies come in or out of the city. And basically the people inside the city get so weak and start to starve. And at that point where they're the weakest, the Assyrian army would go into the city and I hate to say this, but would kill every man, woman and child and everything there. That's how it was back in the day. That was the Assyrian people. That's what they were known for. Jonah was an Israelite, okay? Jonah, God had told him to take a message to the great city of Nineveh. Guess where Nineveh is? In Assyria, right? So God wants Jonah, this Israelite, to take a message to the people that he hates most of all and that hate him most of all. Let's see how Jonah reacted. Jonah chapter 1, starting in verse 1, says this. The word of the Lord came to Jonah, son of Amittai. Go to the great city of Nineveh and preach against it because its wickedness has come up before me. But Jonah ran away from the Lord and headed for Tarshish. He went down to Joppa where he found a ship bound for that port. After paying the fare, he went aboard and sailed for Tarshish to flee from the Lord. How about that? So Jonah catches the next ship out of town in the exact opposite direction of where God told him to go. Tarshish was about as far away as it could possibly be from where God wanted him to go. He ran away. I heard God tell me to do something. Nope, I ain't doing it. I'm heading the exact opposite direction. And then, as you probably know, because you grew up in Sunday school, you heard the story. He gets on this ship, and what happens? There's a storm that hits. And the storm is hitting, Jonah's down below deck, and these guys are wondering, what caused this incredible storm? How are we going to make it out of here alive? And Jonah comes up to the top of the deck, and he says, guys, it's on me, man. I'm running away from what God told me to do. That's why God's causing this storm. You know what you need to do to get the storm to stop? Take me and throw me overboard. And the guys are like, what? Wait, wait a minute. God spoke to you, we're supposed to throw you overboard. Yep, that's what you're supposed to do. Just throw me overboard. So reluctantly, they grab Jonah and they throw him into the raging sea where he's swallowed by a, a whale, a giant fish. Comes along and swallows him up. And the Bible says that he lives. Jonah lives inside the giant fish for three days and three nights. If you know your New Testament, that's kind of an important thing to remember, right? And this is where a lot of people who maybe are a little curious to Christian faith, they wonder. They say things like, ah, I can't believe Christians believe this stuff. It's like a fairy tale. This is why I don't believe in Christianity, some of them say. This is why some people walk away from the faith, because they think it's so ridiculous that we as Christians would believe that a man could live inside of a giant fish for three days and three nights. And there's some Christians that like to double down at this point. And they like to go, the Bible says it, God says it, that settles it, I believe it. If God can create the world in seven days, he can do whatever he wants to do. He can make a man live inside of a fish. And just for the record, I'm okay with that. If you're here today and you believe that's literally what happened, I'm okay with that. I know lots of good Christians who believe that. And if you're here today, like scholars down through the centuries who believe that this story isn't a literal story, but is actually teaching a deeper truth, and Jonah didn't actually get swallowed by a whale, literally, I'm okay with that too, believe it or not. Because lots of good, strong Christian men and women have believed that version of the story down through the centuries. What I'm not okay with, you ready for this? Is when somebody gets so caught up in arguing about if a man was really swallowed by a fish and if he really lived inside a fish, that they miss the whole point of the book of Jonah. 
That I'm not okay with. Now, I got to give a little shameless plug here, okay? If you're looking for, like, I, I want to know how to understand the Bible. I want to know that more. We're going to have a, a group fair here in a couple of weeks. Or is it next week, Clint? 27. 27, a couple of weeks. And all of our groups, new groups that are starting are going to be out there. It'd be a great thing for you to get involved in. My friend Mark Crumley and I are going to be starting a group five weeks every other Tuesday, starting September 19th, which we're going to call it Understanding the Bible. And we're going to talk about things like this. How do you know and understand the Bible? So shameless plug, if you want to join us, we would love to have you join us on September 19th. At the end of this story, at the end of chapter 2, what happens the giant fish that swallowed Jonah. What does he do to Jonah? Okay, I heard spit. I heard puke. I heard vomit. Spew. Barf. That's release. That's a hurl. That's exactly what happens. The giant fish hurls Jonah, spews Jonah, put your favorite adjective in there, out onto the shore. And God gets Jonah's attention for a second time. And he says, now, Jonah, I want you to listen to me this time. And this is what he says. Jonah chapter 3, starting in verse 1. Then the word of the Lord came to Jonah a second time. Go to the great city of Nineveh and proclaim to it the message I give you. Jonah obeyed the word of the Lord and went to Nineveh. Now, Nineveh was a very large city. It took three days to go through it. Jonah began by going a day's journey into the city, proclaiming, 40 more days and Nineveh will be overthrown. The Ninevites believed God. A fast was proclaimed, and all of them, from the greatest to the least, put on sackcloth. When Jonah's warning reached the king of Nineveh, he rose from his throne, took off his royal robes, covered himself with sackcloth, and sat down in the dust. This is the proclamation he issued in Nineveh. By the decree of the king and his nobles, do not let people or animals, herds or flocks taste anything. Do not let them eat or drink, but let people and animals be covered with sackcloth. Let everyone call urgently on God. Let them give up their evil ways and their violence. Who knows? God may yet relent and with compassion turn from his fierce anger so that we will not perish. Verse 10, when God saw what they did and how they turned from their evil ways, he relented and did not bring on them the destruction he had threatened. Whoa! Now, do you realize what's happening here? Jonah's enemies, the mean, nasty Assyrians, probably some of the worst people you could ever possibly know, are repenting of their sin. That means they're turning away from the way they used to live and they hear this message that Jonah's preaching, God's message, and they start turning to him. That's what the sackcloth and the dust is all about. That's how they mourned back in the day. They put on sackcloth, they put dust all over them, they're doing that to themselves and to the animals. It's absolutely amazing. And if something like that happened here in Medina, we'd be going, Woo, look at this. All these people are turning to God. It's amazing. Wouldn't that be amazing? you got to check out Jonah's response in chapter 4, verse 1. Here's how Jonah responds. But to Jonah, this seemed very wrong, and he became angry. He prayed to the Lord. Isn't this what I said, Lord, when I was still at home? That is what I tried to forestall by fleeing to Tarshish. I knew that you are a gracious and compassionate God, slow to anger and abounding in love, a God who relents from sending calamity. Now, Lord, take away my life, for it is better for me to die than to live. Jonah is angry with God. Jonah's like, this is exactly why I tried to go to Tarshish. I knew it. Keep in mind, those of you who think, oh yeah, the Old Testament God was so mean and nasty, not according to Jonah. Jonah knew what the Old Testament God was like, the same God we serve today. He was loving and compassionate, and he wants to offer forgiveness and grace. Jonah says that here. Jonah says, I knew that's what you would do. That's why I didn't want to go. I can't believe this is happening. And then in verse 3, Jonah, check it out if you're an underline or underline, Jonah asks God to take away his life. You talk about angry. Take away my very life. He's so angry that his enemies are listening to this message that they're turning to God. He wants to die himself. 
Now we're getting to the point of the story. This is what Jonah is all about. It's not about whether a man can live inside of a giant fish for three days. This story is about whether Jonah is willing to allow God's redeeming love and grace to flow through him so much that he's able to love and forgive even his enemies. That's what this story is about. And that reminds me of something Jesus had to say in his most famous sermon on the mount from Matthew chapter 5. I want to put it up here. He says this. You've heard that it was said, love your neighbor and hate your enemy. But I tell you, love your enemies and pray for those who persecute you, that you may be children of your Father in heaven. He causes his son to rise on the evil and the good and send rain on the righteous and the unrighteous. See what Jesus is doing there? He's saying, you've heard that it was said. Well, where did they hear? Because in the Old Testament, in other places, several places in the Old Testament, actually, it says just the opposite. In fact, in Proverbs, it says, if your enemy is hungry, give him food to eat. If he is thirsty, give him water to drink. In the Old Testament, the Bible was saying, no, we're supposed to show love to our enemies. But see, there were zealots and rabbis in Jesus' day that were teaching a different message. That's why he says, you've heard these people say that you're supposed to love people who are like you, Jewish people, but you're supposed to hate the Gentiles, anybody who's opposite you. Jesus says, no. He says, no. You're supposed to love your enemies and pray for those who persecute you. That's what I want you to do. That's how I want you to live. This was a brand new teaching. And maybe it's what we missed in the book of Jonah when we were so caught up in wondering about this big fish. <laughs> Is the fish cool? Yeah, it's cool. But it's not the point of the story. The point of the story is this. What happens in your heart? You ready for this? What happens in your heart when your enemies are more open to God's message than you are? How do you think Jonah felt when God wasn't necessarily on his side, but he was also on the side of the Assyrians? He wanted to extend his love and compassion to the people that Jonah hated. That's the beauty of this story. It's not about a giant fish. It's about what lurks deep in my heart and maybe your heart when it comes to people who have hurt us. People who need to be forgiven, but we just can't find any way to forgive them. And what I love about this story is that God asked Jonah at the end of chapter 4, he says, should I not have concern for the great city of Nineveh? God created the people in Nineveh, the Assyrians. He wants a relationship with them, just like he wanted a relationship with Jonah, just like he wants a relationship with you. They were people that he loves, created in his image. Jonah, shouldn't I have compassion for them? Shouldn't you have compassion for them? It's so easy for us to avoid these difficult questions and focus on whether a man can live inside of a whale. See, God wants us to love all people, even our enemies, even those who hurt us. What's amazing about the story of Jonah and why it's one of my favorites is because it doesn't have a nice bow tied on to the end of it. It doesn't end all happy. In fact, I want you to see how it ends in chapter 4, verse 9. These are Jonah's last words. He says this, I'm so angry, I wish I were dead. How about that? To me, that's incredibly sad. Because we, as human beings, can allow anger and unforgiveness to eat us up from the inside. And it can ruin us. It can take over our life. And I don't want that to happen to you today. I believe you're here for a reason. I believe God wants you to know how much he loves you and forgives you, no matter what you've done. And he provided a way for you to have a relationship with him. He came to this earth and took on flesh in the person of Jesus, showed us how to live, showed us we're supposed to love our enemies, pray for those that persecute us. Because he lived the way he lived, they put him on a cross and they crucified him. 
He was in the tomb for three days, three nights. And then he rose from the dead. And he is alive today. And he wants a relationship with you. And no matter what you've done, no matter how far you've run, I went to Tarshish. I know he was calling me, but I ran the other way. God loves you. He wants a relationship with you. He forgives you. And I've talked to people who've been in church their whole lives. They know all of those facts. They know in their mind about how God loves them. They know that God's forgiven them. They know about the cross and the resurrection. And you know what? They can't forgive themselves. And to me, it's so sad. And I know you're not giving me permission, but I'm going to push in a little hard here. You know what that is when you can't forgive yourself? It's pride and arrogance. If the God of the universe loves you and forgives you, how dare you not forgive yourself? For some of us, that's where forgiveness starts. And when we're not able to forgive ourselves, we can't extend forgiveness to other people, especially our enemies. So as we close, I just want to ask you to do me a favor. Could you just close your eyes for a second? I'm not going to pray yet, but I want to lead you on a little exercise here that was helpful for me. Just use your imagination again, if you wouldn't mind. And I want you to picture someone standing in front of you who needs to be forgiven. For some of you, maybe that's yourself. For others, it's a group of people or a particular person in your life. Could you just picture them in your mind, in your imagination right now? And then I want you to say these words to them. If you need to say them out loud, it's okay to say them out loud, but say these words. Because Jesus has forgiven me, I forgive you. Because Jesus has forgiven me, I forgive you. What is their response, that person's response right now? I want you to notice what you're feeling right now. Maybe that person who hurt you is gone and they're not even on this earth anymore, but you are harboring feelings of anger and bitterness just like Jonah. And I don't want that to eat you alive. I don't want that to ruin your life. Would you forgive them today? Maybe that person is alive, maybe even in this room, and you need to go make things right you do that today? Would you forgive yourself? In just a minute, we're going to close as the worship team comes, and we're going to sing a song as a blessing. And I challenge us to sing that song as a blessing over our enemies, even those that have hurt us. Can we sing these words to even people who have hurt us and betrayed us? Heavenly Father, um, I need your help. We need your help for that kind of forgiveness. I can't find that kind of forgiveness in my own spirit. And that's sad. But I know that you can help me forgive. God, I'm so grateful that you have forgiven me time and time again and shown me your grace and your mercy. And God, I pray that I'd be able to, to share that same grace and mercy with everyone in my life even those who hurt me. I pray that for every one of my friends here today. God, through your power, through the power of your spirit, help us to be able to forgive. Help us to learn the lesson of Jonah. And God, I pray even now as we sing the, the words of these song, this song, God, that it would be a blessing that we could pray over those folks who have hurt us. We want to be the kind of people that you created us to be, a people who love and forgive and show mercy and grace, even when we're hurt, because that's what you did for us. Thank you for your son, Jesus. In his name we pray, amen.